So, um, hello everyone. I'm absolutely honored to be here. I can't uh, express how great. I don't want to be anywhere in the world but in this room with these people on this panel this morning and everyone who's going to be speaking and everyone who can make a difference about this. Um, so, my name is Kathleen Richardson. I'm going to talk about sex robots. Now, um, I'm going to start with this because um, I want to tell you the underlying theory of why I launched a campaign against sex robots. And I think having a good ground beneath you is very important. If you don't have the ground, then all it seems is a moral reaction as well. Oh, I don't like sex robots. There's more to it than that. And I'm going to tell you what that more to it is. So we will get to the sex robots, but it's, it's a little bit along the way, along the story. So this is what sex robots can do. These are academics. Right? employed in universities writing this. They can end prostitution. They can end child sexual exploitation. They can end human loneliness. They can make men, particularly better lovers, they can help men not to have relationships with women. They can add excitement to sex. What more could you want than having a doll brought into your like, intimate private relations? So these are all real arguments. We have to take them seriously. These are now being mobilized and pushed out in journal articles and news articles. And, and so there's a real campaign now, if you like, to normalize this idea that it's OK for human beings to have life with artifacts. And there are some people critical of the sex robots. They say, oh, yes, we disagree with the idea that the sex robot is, has a female form. But, you know, if it didn't have a female form, if it had a shape like an octopus or a spaceship, and people used it, they, the underlying idea that people could have relationships with artifacts is not questioned. So I want to question that very idea. And so I want to argue that sex robots fed off the idea that people could have relationships with machines. And this idea began when I began doing my research as a, I'm a social anthropologist in a technology department. It's a long story, but I studied um, social anthropology. And when all my colleagues went off to Amazonia and Mongolia to study, um, study groups, I went to the humanoid robotics group at MIT. And there they were building these humanoid robots. And I thought, right, the time has come. We're all going to have these um, ironing robots and robots that do you washing up. And then when I got there, I found this. This robot's called Mertz, right? And this robot, as you can see, has got no arms, got no body. The robot is designed solely to interact with people. And I knew at that moment something had changed in how we started thinking about machines. Because now, if you think about it, we're human beings. We have relationships with each other. And we use machines in order to facilitate our relationships with each other. And now people are saying, no, no, the direct object of your relationship can be a machine, right? So this is a big moving point in our cultural consciousness. And this was in the early 2000s that I began this research. And so I began to, you know, um, hear all these stories like, for example, uh, loneliness, uh, aging populations are very lonely. So, if we, you know, let's give them machines because machines can become their friends, right? And I have to say, at the time when I first heard this idea, and I'm sure you're all familiar with it now because it's out there in the public domain, I didn't know what to say, actually. I thought, well, it's better than nothing. Well, why not? You know, we can't, it's better than nothing. Okay, you might still want to change the system, but why not give a person a machine? And I want to come to something interesting here because I was trying to make sense of this problem about uh, where we are as human beings and how we're looking upon each other and how we're looking at the relationship with the world around us. And, oops, there were... So I went, uh, I collected all this data from the anthropology, the robotics lab, and I went back to my department, and I started to try and make sense of what I'd found. How can I make sense of this idea that we can have relationships with machines? So there were two very dominant models, and actually they're still out there, and you could probably, the mainstream ideas, you can fit into either or one of these models. The first one is the egocentric paradigm, the ego, the individualist model, the I model. So we all have it. That, you know, uh, sci uh, transhumanism is an I model, that you're an I, that your en enhancement is about turning yourself into a kind of machine. 
Um, it's very associated with patriarchy and masculinity. And this is taken from Facebook. When you use Facebook, you're actually working within a paradigm model about human connectedness, that your individuals connected by nodes. So there was this model as a way to explain. And if you think about the person and then the, the machine as a, as a node that you're connected to, then this model can explain what I was finding at MIT, that you could have relationships with machines. And then there's this, I suppose lefties are a bit more familiar with this model, there's the we model, we are all connected. And um, there's a few ideas around this, so queer theory, for example, is a we model, there is no boundaries. But I often use this idea of the uh, cyborg manifesto, I don't know if you've read Donna Haraway, but I use this image because if you look at it, it's a woman, she's draped at a computer, uh, there's an animal um, uh, uh, covering her, the swirling ga galaxies in the background. And what this model is, is it's all about the breakdown between people and things. We are all connected. And actually some uh, techie people also subscribe to this model as well. So on the one hand, I've got this egocentric, we're individualist, we're atomized, and on the other, I've got we're all connected with everything. See where I'm going with this? They're actually reflections of each other, in a way, the kind of one and the many paradigms. So I struggled with this, and I, I was kind of thinking, well, where do the ideas for these paradigms come from? Some of them, even the I model and the we model come from very good places, you know, so one of the we ideas is that there's a universal humanism, so people aren't uh, distinguished by, by race, sex and class. That was a progressive development of that idea, but then it turned into them when, then we're not distinctive from anything at all, and actually... I mean, there are really people in anthropology that say the, the chairs in a room have as much agency as the people. Um, so some of these models are clearly have a, have a good origin, but they've turned into these very kind of uh, egocentric or deconstructed de, de, uh, paradigms. So instead, I then still didn't have the answers for this, so I went on and did my next project, looking around this research, and I began to look at ideas about how we think about being human. So I started to do research about robots and autism. And what I noticed in the lab is they started to say not only that people could have machines as friends, but now certain kinds of human beings, people with autism, for example, were like machines, and actually we could build machines using autism as a platform to think about how we build social machines. And so this was my research for a long time. And um, maybe you're all familiar with the work of... Simon Baron Cohen, who kind of articulates these ideas very well, he says there's a, there's a male and a female on a, on a spectrum. There's a female who's naturally empathetic, and there's a, a male who's a, a systematizer, not naturally empathetic, and autism is an extreme male brain. And at this extreme, it becomes more like a machine. So those were those ideas that I was developing. And, you know, it's... It's funny how some of, the fa you know, some of the faces that I've just seen them were a bit shocked that those analogies between people with autism and machines were made. But actually, if you go into robotics labs, it's very common. And what starts to happen is something that should shock people starts to become normalized. And that's exactly what happened. And so I'm still searching around for answers. I can't make sense of this idea that we are machines, um, that we could have relationships with them. So I begin to look elsewhere. I be begin to start looking outside. And this, is, this, for example, is from popular culture. And this person who created this image wanted to have an autistic kid and his robot. And in it, the robot looks more alive than the child with autism. So people aren't doing anything out of unkindness. Some people think this is a very kind way to think about autism sometimes. Um, so, I was at a loss, and it's taken me 10 years of research around this area. So what I began to notice was everything more or less was about childhood. Childhood was coming a lot in, up in my research. So what was it about childhood? The robots that I was looking at were designed like children because people, the designers wanted to people to interact with them, so they had to create them very childlike to encourage their interaction. 
And then I, I, I came across a different way of understanding the world, which has really underpinned my ideas about sex robots. And that is this, and I tell everybody this, it's about attachment, it's about human bonds, it's about our ties. And for example, nobody in this room exists either alone or connected to everything. Nobody in this room is alive without somebody else taking care of you, feeding you, looking after you, showing you love, showing you kindness. We don't exist as an I, solitary, independently of others. But we aren't, you know, we don't know everybody in the world either. Some of our relationships are more personal and private than others. And then I began to look at other things from attachment studies, so children who were born in the wild. And interestingly, even though there's a lot of stories about children born in the wild, there's not many actual um, cases, verified cases. But the ones which they could verify, they did find something very interesting. They found that the, uh, the children started to imitate the animals, the sounds of the animals, the behaviors. So children are imitating what they're, what they're seeing around them. And then also I began to look at, read stories, a bit like yours, Sammy, um, about abuse uh, survivors, and look at what had happened in their childhood and how it impacted on their lives, and look at things. This is taken from Romania, this image here, where they basically, um, due to all uh, various reasons, locked children away in these orphanages, and they all developed severe attachment disorders. So we know, we, we know that something's going on because we know that there's a mental health crisis. We know know that underlying in our culture there's something going on about people's attachment that's not giving people the right kind of experience and the resources to cope with what they're um, facing today. And of course, I don't want to go into the Harry Harlow experiments too much, but very briefly, so this was an idea to look at surrogate mothering. Uh, they take an infant monkey from its mother, put it in a lab. Um, one of the, uh, the wire monkey had a, had a bottle on and the other one had a soft covering and then they observed it and they said, well, the monkey with the infant was going to the, the cage, they would eat, well, drink from the, 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 the bottle and then spend hours and hours and hours holding on to the soft covering. And what they actually said from this is that actually people need love, right? This was a finding from this study. Unfortunately, they still do these studies and um, I think that's a real problem because we know that uh, primates are a very intelligent species. But what they don't also reveal about these experiments is that when they released those monkeys, when the experiments were over and they put those monkeys back in the environment, they couldn't, they couldn't mate. They couldn't socialize because they hadn't learned how to socialize because you don't become a monkey on your own. We don't become human beings on our own. We become human beings through our relations with each other. And um, other, other issues around we know that animals in captivity, they display much of the same kind of behaviors that you might display in distressed children, so self-harm and problems with reproduction and mating. So we know attachment as a species, we're human beings, we're an intelligent species, um, but animals are also a species and we need each other. And I guess for me, what's going on in a culture where we start saying, actually, we don't need each other anymore. We're going to discard everything that we know about human attachment, about bonding, about ties, about how, our humanity. And I'll give you an example. In my field of anthropology, no one will defend being human beings anymore. Right? They reject the human beings because they see human beings as, as, a, as a myth, as something like extinction rebellion, <laughs> some kind of harmful um, species on the planet, whereas I think that is true and we have to take that into account, but we're the own, we are a species that can bring about change, but we can't bring about change unless we, we have this strong ties between us that we developed. So what I've been doing my, in my work is developing the I-thou model. The, the each other models, and that's where I'm going to get to uh, the sex robots. Oops! Don't look at the images. <laughs> right. 
So then, as I, as I say, I've been in the lab now, I've been looking at social robotics, companion robots as they're called, therapeutic robot, robots for 10 years, and so all of a sudden, this new kind of robot comes along. And I'm not a feminist at this stage, I'm, I'm actually even pro-pornography and pro-prostitution. So if I can change, anybody can change. And what I begin to notice is, again, they start making analogies, but now this time uh, with women and sex robots. And the analogy they start to make is between sex robots and women in prostitution as one of the most significant ones. And this analogy comes down to lacking empathy for the woman in prostitution. You know, you have, you have a need, it's gratified in this, um, in this egocentric way, and it doesn't matter if you uh, change that prostituted woman for an object. I mean, that is the basis of prostitution, basically. So I began to notice these parallels, and this time I thought, right, well, I've acquired enough evidence now to say that human relationships, we're not interchangeable with artifacts. If you deprive human, uh, human beings of good social relationships and social relationships, it has a detrimental impact on them, on their lives, on their relationships, on the way they develop as human beings. And so I had accumulated enough evidence to then start questioning this model. And um, so one of the issues that always comes up is it's just an artifact. It's just, you know, it's just like a, a dildo or a vibrator. But I don't know many women that want to marry their vibrators. And I've set up a website, you know, about their relationships with their vibrators. May, I'm, in this day and age, there probably is one. But um, the reality is there are artifacts in the world, clearly, some people use these artifacts in order to arrive at sexual pleasure. That's nothing new. People use feather, bubbles, whatever. Um, there are some issues around the history of vibrators that I'm, gonna, I'm not going to outline here, but you can read it in my book. Um, but then there's the image below. You know, where does that come from? Is it just about sexual pleasure? Is it just an object? Well, for the people viewing that, it is an object, and that object is called woman when she is sexually objectified. And so it was, again, it's not the idea that someone has come along and created an artifact that you rub your genitals on, but I knew that behind the scenes there was this whole argument that actually you could start having relationships with objects, you know, and that we could start making, we can, can start personifying machines or objects to look like us, and we can put them in place of human beings. And this is a very dangerous idea that I, I try to address in all my work. So that's when I launched uh, a campaign against sex robots. So I'm new to campaigning. I've learned a lot from groups like Nordic Model Now and, and uh, many, many affilia and all those amazing groups. Um, I'm, a, I'm, a lear I'm learning about it. You know, I guess I'm more comfortable in a kind of academic setting. So I want to create partnerships and develop this idea. But I'm not yet a feminist, you see. I know there's something wrong with this. I know that they're rejecting the idea of attachment. I know there's something about objectification going on, but I'm not a feminist. And, and um, one thing I do know is that they start to say, well, sex robots are going to reduce prostitution. Now when you go to a brothel in Germany, you can have a choice between a real human woman right, or a doll. It hasn't, it hasn't reduced it. There is now pornography. Um, featuring uh, performers and, and sex dolls now. So that would be a new market area where you kind of enroll. Um, I'm not even going to go into the area of child sexual exploitation and child uh, rape dolls because if it's going on in those domains, you know it's going to be spreading out. And we know that also um, partners of men are being asked if, if dolls can become part of their sex lives. So this is having a kind of creeping effect on, if you like, the social relations, uh, a, a kind of new niche market within the porn industry. And it's backed up, you see, it's backed up by very intelligent people from places like MIT and uh, you know, colleges and universities around the world who have academics in their department. You have to keep an eye on the time for me. <clears throat> So it's this idea, fundamentally, about our interchangeability. Are we interchangeable with artifacts? Uh, no. And <clears throat> I'm going to just very briefly go uh, through this. So one of the advocates of sex robots, they don't even like disguise their analogies um, between sex robots and prostitution. When he asked where he got the idea from sex, uh, sex with dolls, 
He says, then I got the idea that sex with dolls is like sex with prostitutes. You know, the prostitute doesn't love you and care for you. It's only interested in the size of your wallet. So I thought, well, you know, one can be exchanged for another. So these are very explicit um, kind of arguments coming out of academia, purporting and proposing that sex robots is going to be good for our society. And at the moment, unfortunately, that's just me. <laughs> um, but I'm trying to build that community to be a bit wider. And then I began to read around the work of Rachel Moran. It was actually Rachel Moran who influenced me, right? Because I used to follow her on Twitter to stop using the word sex work. Because I used to use that word. I thought I was being nice. I thought I was actually, you know, showing my solidarity. So through her, I was just used to, you know, be observing her conversations with others in the world. I stopped, started to think about my own use of uh, terms, and I started to change them. And so I do that now in all my work, and I explain whenever I do it. Um, and obviously, then I started to come across this thing. It's called abolitionism. Never heard of it. Um, I'm going to skip this because I haven't got time to go through that. Um, <clears throat> in the about eight months after I launched my campaign against sex robots, I happened to read two books in tandem. One was called Civil Rights, Pornography and Civil Rights by Andrea Dworkin and Catherine McKinnon, and the other was The Politics by Aristotle. And I advised people to read these books together. And it was, it, it was there that I first came across the abolitionist argument um, in pornography and civil rights. Let me just tell you about Aristotle. Aristotle is a famed philosopher of ethics. Let me tell you something about Aristotle, <laughs> right? Aristotle was an advocate of slavery. This is what he said about a slave. And think about what I said earlier about people and machines being interchangeable. He says, tools may be animate as well as inanimate. A slave is a sort of living piece of property. How, how convenient when you start getting people to, um, to view themselves as machines or tools or artifacts. Um, I think it's to do with this kind of culture of domination and control. He also had another fantasy in the politics where he talks about, you know, People look to this, it's on Radio 4 and everything, you know, you, you often hear this, uh, this paragraph read out a lot about these super machines, these autonomous machines that are coming into our lives. Aristotle said, wouldn't it be great if we lived in a future and artifacts could just mobilize themselves? You know, a bit like magical animism. If you've ever watched The Sorcerer's Apprentice where the, you know, the, 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 the brush comes alive. So this kind of fantasy that objects themselves can become alive. Now, there was nothing in this paragraph or in the entire work of Aristotle which shows he was anti-slavery and he had any, intelligent, any intention of abolishing it. What it shows us is he wanted to have an elite, and that elite should be serviced in any way, whether it be with human beings or with artifacts. And the other thing about um, slavery is it's a rejection of reciprocity. It's a rejection of the attachment that we have with each other as human beings, because it's about a different kind of relationship. So in the book, he talks about the master-slave relationship. The slave must respond to the master, but the master does not need to respond to the slave. It's a disconnection of attachment and ties and bonds between human beings. It's a very profound statement. Now, you would think, knowing all this, that you might not want to have this on your CV. You're an Aristotelian, right? But you'd be surprised how widespread Aristotelian ethics is. And if Aristotelian ethics is shaping the way that we think about each other and our world around us, well, we've got some really serious problems to contend with. So one of the things I try to do is I'm trying to show that you cannot just take out the bits of someone's theory that you don't like. And if the content of it, if it's fundamental content, is really about objectification of human beings. And um, of course, then this works. Now, I have, I'm going to race through this because I think it's really interesting. So, where does our idea come from that we're not property? Human beings have known that they're not property, right, since time began. Animals do not regard themselves as property. We, but we created social systems that regarded people as property. So if we take one example, like in the United States, all men are created equal. Uh, women don't have a look in yet. Um, now, all men are created equal, yet they've still got slavery. So they've got a problem on their hands. 
So they had to create the 14th, uh, the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery 88 years after the Declaration of Independence was signed. But now then they've got another problem, because now they've got all these freed slaves, but they don't have any legal recognition, they don't have any legal personality. So that they have to create the 14th Amendment. Now, the reason why I refer to this, you're thinking, why is she taking me down this historical road? Is because at the same time in which, this was the first time, certainly in American legal history, that there would have been a, a move towards the idea of humanism, the idea that there was a universal humanism. Because uh, this was the point where they said, right, we're gonna give rights to all men. Women don't have a look in, but give rights to all men. Exactly at that point, corporations then said, right, well, we're people too. We should have recognitions as persons. And that's where you get the idea of a corporate being a person. So at the moment, when we extend the franchise to in include more human beings, somehow the elites have managed to create another cultural construction to start claiming power back. And, um, and then we don't have women's rights till 188 years, don't have equal recognition under the law until 188 years. And we know that sex rights of women are under attack all around the world and we have to fight for them every day. So how does this connect with now? There is a move, for example, more widely to try and turn robots into persons. And this was even at the European level, right? They started to float the idea that you could talk about a robot as an electronic person. Um, so think about this. Um, you've got, um, I don't know if you know these robots, but uh, this robot here is called um, Sophia and went to Saudi Arabia and got given citizenship in a country that the women don't have citizenship, so ironically. Then Azerbaijan, because if you have citizenship in one country, then other countries recognize you in an international legal framework. So Azerbaijan gave Sofia a visa. And um, where is this all leading to? Well, think about it. If we can abolish personhood, if we can abolish what it means to be human, we can bring in a whole new regime of reorganizing the world. I mean, it's a quite a profound transformation, I think, that's going on. And that will mean you can marry your robot, because the robot, the sex robot now, that is just an artifact, people behind the scenes are thinking, well, how do we give legal rights to these sex robots so people can marry them? Um, and um, clearly that, oh, clearly that, moves us into the problem of creating this more atomized world where people are more alone with their machines and not with each other. It keeps perpetuating the problem that we're trying to solve in the first place. And so I'm just gonna end with this. Um, I call it the pyramid problem in robots and AI. And when people think about the pyramids, what they think about are these glorious structures. You know, you go on holiday and you see them. And what people forget is that the pyramids were created by slaves in the service of a fantasy. So if we are, are thinking about personifying artifacts, machines, dolls, um, how is that going to impact on us? And who are the people really benefiting from that new framework, that new worldview? Um, and it certainly won't be ordinary people. And so I think the abol abolitionist message is absolutely essential and I think the way we can build the abolitionist message and the politics of abolition is to create a new kind of, I call it the politics of love. Because if there's no love, then there's no abolition to begin with and there's no uh, reason to save humanity. Thank you.